Once again, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Eileen Donovan, and I'm the Director of Learning and Engagement at the Lyman Allen Art Museum. Um, and But we're here to really focus uh, with our curator, Tanya Poor, and our two guest speakers, um, uh, Sarah Pike and Rebecca Lear. Uh, so we're here talking about Dumont's prismatic palette in practice. Um, his method and exploring his method of pre-mixing color strings for painting. This event is held in conjunction with the museum's current exhibition, the prismatic palette, Frank Vincent Dumont and his students. It is on view until October 3rd. So you have plenty of time to still see this really beautiful exhibition. Um, so Tanya is the curator, Lyman Allen curator of the exhibition, and she, said, Rebecca Lear and Sarah Pike will explain and demonstrate the basic ideas of the prismatic palette and will compare their approaches to using and teaching the method. Rebecca Lear teaches at the Ridgewood Art Institute in Ridgewood, New Jersey, which reflects the teaching of Dumont student Arthur Maynard. Sarah Pike great-granddaughter of Frank Vincent Dumont, studied with Dumont student Francis Weston Hoyt and plein air practice in New Hampshire. So first intro introducing Rebecca Lear a little more fully. After working as an editorial illustrator for 20 years, Rebecca Lear devoted herself to fine art oil painting. She has received awards and honors for both her paintings and illustrations from Oil Painters of America, Hudson Valley Artist Association, and the Society of Illustrators of New York, just to name a few. Her work is in the permanent collection of the Franklin Institute Museum in Philadelphia, and she won the Land of Enchantment Book Award. She teaches oil painting at the Ridgewood Art Institute, where she was first taught to use the prismatic palette developed by Frank Vincent Dumond. And Sarah Pike, is a painter and printmaker whose work explores the natural world. Pike received her MFA from the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. She has been an artist in residence at the Franz Manzarel Center in Belgium and the Steindruck München in Munich and has printed with the master printers at Keystone Editions in Berlin, Steinwerk in Leipzig and one that I'm not going to pronounce uh, in Switzerland. <laughs> Her work has been exhibited in group and solo exhibitions in North America and Europe. Pike has taught studio art at the Community College of Vermont in printmaking at Bennington College. Pike currently owns a laser cutting studio, Freefall Laser, where she collaborates with artists on custom laser cutting projects. Um, and so in case anyone has not had the opportunity to view the exhibition at the Lyman Allen Art Museum, um, Tanya Port will go through a bit of the program and the exhibition um, before taking it off with Rebecca and Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eileen, for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, let's see if I can share a screen here. Yep. Great. Um, yeah, we have some images here that will hopefully just give a sense, an overview of our exhibition that we have in the show. Um, and encourage everyone to come and visit if they if they haven't been or if they have have come through to kind of come back and maybe um, see the work again. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful exhibition. It will be on view uh, through October third, which gives us a little bit more time to show. So the exhibition celebrates and explores the work of American artist. Frank Vincent Dumont, uh, looking at his, the overview of his career in running from the 1890s, late 1880s actually, um, until his death in 1951. Uh, so the end, it focuses on his role and his legacy as a teaching instructor. And Dumont had a tremendously long and productive career, 
um, affiliated for 59 years with the Art Students League of New York. Uh, where he was an institution, <laughs> a venerable instructor. Um, and so our exhibition really shows that scope um, uh, with works by Dumond. This is a really lovely self-portrait in graphite that I love that, that you know, sort of shows his character. Um, and then we have segments of the exhibition um, that, that showcase his teaching, focusing on the work of some of his students, um, and with a special section near the end that looks at this prismatic palette um, practice in teaching that has really endured and persevered and been passed on from Dumond to his students and then from those students to sub subsequent generations. So Sarah and Rebecca are, are a kind of testament to this ongoing painting tradition um, that we'll explore. So you can see here, this is um, several pieces in a case at the end of the exhibition that show um, artifacts, Helen, uh, Helen Xavier Dumont's palette on the right, uh, a board that was Franklin to Dumont's in the center, and then at the left, um, a new palette that Sarah Pike recreated for the exhibition. So um, just to give a little bit of an overview here, we have work in the exhibition that shows some of Dumont's very early academic paintings that were composed in France while he was studying um, there and working with in several different ateliers um, and, and really sort of absorbing the breadth um, of this kind of deep, uh, long academic tradition in French art, um, working with Lefebvre uh, and a number of other artists. So in works like this example, um, we see Dumond, one thing that, that he, was really lauded for in reviews in, you know, at in the 1890s as he was composing these pieces was his ability to create um, religious scenes that are within this very venerable tradition of landscape or of, of history painting rather, um, but that he really humanized them, made them very accessible to viewers in a way that other academic painting at the time often didn't, you know, things had become a little bit overly formal and stilted, uh, but he kind of infused his figures with this very expressive, um, this sort of sense of their personhood. They were very relatable. Um, there's another painting that he submitted to the, the salon, the Paris salon that won an award uh, a painting of the Holy Family. Um, and that was, was commented on in, in that example and in this one as well, where Christ is appearing to two fishermen who had been out at sea all night, had caught nothing. But then as he approaches them, they suddenly sort of have their nets full of fish. So it's a sort of miracle that occurs in his presence. Uh, while he's working and painting in Paris, he's creating a range of work, um, not just large academic history paintings for exhibition, but also pieces like this exquisite, very detailed, um, beautiful still life of the yellow roses. Helen Xavier Dumont, who met and married Frank Vincent Dumont in 1895, uh, at the Art Students League, they had met when Helen was an art student, Frank was a very young instructor and they fell in love, uh, married and honeymooned in France in the second half of the 1890s. And Helen's work is really amazing. And it's, it's very sad that her large academic paintings that were submitted to the salon uh, were burned in a later studio fire but several small landscapes from this period are in our exhibition, 
such as this um, lovely scene here, that gives a sense of her, her skill as an artist. And um, in several other examples in the exhibition, it's interesting to sort of compare and contrast her work with Frank's work to see some overlaps um, in terms of their interests in, in painting landscape, uh, but also some differences as well. One thing that's so remarkable about Dumond is the breadth of the, the work, the type of painting that he created in his early career, particularly. Um, he did a lot of illustration work, uh, painting scenes for magazine illustration, newspaper illustration, as well as illustrating books. Um, and this was something many American artists in sort of this turn of the 20th century, early 20th century, um, there was a great deal of, of work in illustration. Um, and this is a really lovely example depicting a scene from Mark Twain's Joan of Arc. And this is perhaps one of Dumont's you know, best known uh, illustration projects was that he illustrated the full uh, book of um, the Recollections of Joan of Arc by Mark Twain. Um, this particular painting at the Art Students League was, I think, finished after the book had been published a number of years after. And I think it's a reworking of the scene uh, where Joan of Arc is inspired and receives this kind of divine guidance from the saints that directs her on her quest to take up arms uh, to, to fight for France's freedom. Um, another example of this, this sort of breadth of Dumas' career uh, is his work in mural painting. He did a tremendous number of murals, some of which are, are no longer extant, um, but these are two really beautiful, very large, mural studies that were done for the Panama Pacific Exposition in 1915. Uh, and this was a project that Helen helped uh, paint these very large murals uh, that decorated the triumphal arch that welcomed visitors into the San Francisco World's Fair in 1915. So these are smaller scale studies that have uh, a grid that's visible sort of in the background. And the artist would use these, Helen and Frank, um, to then expand the, the scale of these, um, these sketches to be 12 feet high, um, and I think 64 feet long each, which is really tremendous. Uh, and these two murals show, sort of depict this story of westward expansion in the 19th century. So the upper scene shows the departure from the east, and the lower scene shows the arrival in the West with um, a allegorical figure of California in her abundance welcoming uh, folks that way. And these are on loan from the Florence Griswold Museum in Lyme, which uh, have supported this show with a number of important loans, which we are grateful for. Uh, there are many beautiful landscapes in this exhibition. This is a scene of Grassy Hill in Old Lyme, where the Dumans acquired a house in 1906. And it, it shows just the sort of beautiful sweeping hillside of Lyme that inspired Dumond to use a brighter, lighter, more impressionistic palette. Um, and it was, it's the source of many, many beautiful landscape paintings that depict the property of the Dumont farm uh, on Grassy Hill. And here is an example of one of the student pieces in the exhibition. Um, this is a watercolor by Ogden Kleisner of Winfield Scott Klein, uh, both of whom had studied at the Art Students League with Dumont. Um, but this I think is, is was, depicts Lyme um, and shows just this plein air painting um, you know, with all the accoutrements, the umbrella, the easel. And I think it's just beautiful, you know, sort of this sense of what it's like to be outdoors um, painting this beautiful landscape of Lyme. And the, the, the Dumans were part of the old Lyme art colony 
um, Frank had initially come out to Lyme to teach a summer school for the Art Students League of New York. Um, but that program was quite large. And after several years, it shifted to a different location. Um, but the Dumans loved Lyme so much that they stayed and acquired property and really were part of this close knit uh, artistic community that Henry Ward Ranger had founded in Lyme that was based around Florence Griswold's boarding house and the property there. So, but while the Dumans summered in Lyme, they spent their academic year in New York City. Uh, and here Frank is teaching at the Art Student League. Um, and so you can see there the student work. This is another piece from the exhibition that is a document um, of the teaching. This is a life study that was done in Dumont's class by John Carlson, a, a prominent artist. Uh, another piece from the exhibition on loan from the Art Students League of New York is this fabulous portrait of Georgia O'Keeffe by artist Eugene Spiker, uh, both of whom studied under Dumont. And you get a sense of the breadth of uh, and the length of Dumont's career by looking at paintings like this, Everett Raymond Kinsler, the very, very famous prolific uh, portraitist who painted so many American presidents, many famous people, um, was a student, a late student of Dumont's. And Frank Mason, a portrait by him on the right here, uh, was the student who essentially took over Dumont's teaching role at the Art Students League following his death in 1951. Um, and Mason really continued many of the tenets, the ideas, um, the methods that Dumont had taught to him. He passed along to several subsequent generations of students at the Art Students League. And Frank Mason was very long lived and prolific in his own work. And he taught at the league until his death in 2009. Uh, so between Dumond and Frank Mason, they represent over a century of teaching, which is a pretty phenomenal and kind of amazing fact to consider. Uh, here we have a watercolor by John Barron in the exhibition another student of Dumont's. And he, as you can see here, represents more uh, of this element of kind of European abstraction that was influencing many artists in the first half of the 20th century. Here's a lovely photograph um, of Dumont teaching in the summer en plein air in Pownal, Vermont. Uh, and so he would lead groups of students to on these teaching expeditions um, to Vermont, also to Nova Scotia was another favorite spot where these sessions would last um, a month, possibly longer, depending. Um, some students would camp out or rent rooms with, with local farmers. And it sounds like this was really one aspect of his teaching um, that resonated very, very strongly with a number of artists. Uh, here, this is a painting by Frank Mason that documents Nova Scotia and that the time he spent with Dumont there. Francis Weston Hoyt, who Sarah will talk about in a moment, was another student of Dumont's. This is a scene of Nova Scotia here, um, painted much later, but showing, you know, this sense of, of kind of how Dumont's own students um, continued this teaching method um, that, that he had taught, um, bringing students out into the landscape, into nature um, in extended teaching sessions. Um, so now that's a little bit of an overview of the exhibition. I would love to turn the tables over to Sarah Pike uh, to talk in depth about her experiences studying with Francis Weston Hoyt, um, learning the prismatic palette method and how she has 
has sort of acquired and employed some of these ideas in her own work teaching. Sarah, and I can forward the slides uh, as needed. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tanya. Um, maybe we'll start with the one of uh, Franz Pallet on the easel. So um, I grew up surrounded by my great grandfather's paintings, uh, kind of steeping in the palette uh, subconsciously. Um, I studied for two summers with Frank Mason up in um, Stowe, and then met Fran in 98 and studied with her in until her death. Um, and here is a sample of uh, Fran's palette uh, next. So next slide. Sorry, Sarah, which it's one? Okay. <laughs> Did we go through it? Did I skip it? Um, maybe maybe go back one. There seems to be a little bit of a lag in my okay. something. Do you want me to share on my end? Um, if you can. Sure. I can yeah, do yeah. Uh, I, just, I just need permission. Um, oh, I got it. Great. Sorry. No, it's fine. All right. So we all seeing Fran's palette on the easel here. Um, so this is uh, Fran's uh, plein air setup at an exhibition of her work a couple of years ago. Um, and an example of that of that palette. And here you see um, the strands um, that Dumond worked with. Um, and a very important aspect of this palette, which many um, students talked about, which is um, it it was a tool, a learning tool, uh, but not a formula. And um, the color mixing and approach did change throughout um, Dumont's lifetime. And so what was important were these basic principles that uh, stayed constant no matter what, um, no matter how the palette was made. And so what I wanna show you today is kind of one of those key principles that has been, has followed, uh, that has followed through um, with me with my own work. So it has followed through in regards to when I was working um, in landscape, when I was working figuratively, uh, when I spent years working as a printmaker, um, and also um, in my work now, which is primarily in watercolor. Um, and this is um, a prismatic, a chromatic approach to color mixing. So we see here um, two uh, student palettes, the one I used when I worked with Fran and then Frank Mason's. And you'll notice that they are slightly different. Fran studied with um, Dumond earlier. Um, so, you know, Frank's palette is slightly different as, as a result that it did change. Um, the palette was set up centered around uh, middle C. So Dumond talked about the palette in regards to music, kind of the middle C on the piano. And when you went up and moved into the light, those are the higher notes of the piano. And when you moved down into the shadow, those are the lower notes. And this organization is extremely helpful when you're out in the landscape because the, the light changes and you need to be able to organize even with this changing um, at light and atmosphere. And so the palette allowed you to look for those light areas and know where in that range you needed to be, as well as the shadow areas. So you can see some of those examples here. And the basic principle that I'm going to talk about tonight um, is, and this was the mantra that Fran uh, 
said over and over again, if it changes in value, it changes in color. So one of the strands that we have here, the top strand here are the tubed colors. And these are primarily cadmiums, very brilliant colors. And the second line here are, is, a, are the value, is the value strand. And so value is how light or dark a color is. Next, we have the sky strand in blue and then the, the uh, green uh, strand. And here at the center of um, cadmium orange, we have parent green, and this green would be mixed up. When I studied with Fran, it was cadmium yellow lemon uh, plus ultramarine blue. And then as it got lighter, yellow was added, and as it got darker, blue violet was added. And so I'm going to switch over to my camera now. I'm gonna stop the share and give you an example of what that means in practice. All right, so here we go. So I have it, my I have my palette here. This is a um, somewhat pared down palette going from the darker values up to the lighters with my middle C, cadmium in the middle. And I also have my parent green, which is cadmium yellow lemon um, mixed with ultramarine blue. Now, the primary way of mixing color um, and working with value um, that is taught is the tint shade method. Um, and this is where, when you want to darken a color, you add black. And when you want to lighten a color, you add white. And this is a little problematic. And I'm going to try, I'm actually going to hopefully exaggerate my color mixing a little bit because um, for some of this, you might just have to bear with me and trust me because um, the color doesn't come through as well over Zoom. But you notice I started with my parent green and added white. And what I've gotten is this lovely chalky mint green. So I'm going to add this lighter value to my value scale here. So when we add black, we dull the color down. And when we add white, we get these chalky colors. Not very prismatic. So Dumont's approach just um, follows in line with 19th century color theory and color mixing um, was the chromatic color mixing approach. And in that one, whenever you change the value, whenever you lightened or darkened something, you changed it also with color. So not just with adding white, but also adding color. So in the green strand, this shows up with our parent green in the center, adding yellow to lighten and blue, value, uh, blue violet to darken. And hopefully you can see that these colors are much more brilliant than the tint shade method here. So the, what that would mean if I wanted to continue and go a little bit lighter here was that if I did choose to add white, I would also bring in some yellow. So I would add some color to that white. And this gets me a nice, brilliant, acidy spring green, one of my favorite times of year. And hopefully you can see um, that this is a brighter, more chromatic, prismatic, brighter color than this kind of chalky mint green. Now, as colors change throughout the season, these, this still applies. So if, if we're thinking about mixing, for example, um, a green that's happening now, so the end of summer is coming and where I am, things are beginning to look a little bit toasty. Um, the greens are moving towards the reds, even though it hasn't, you know, the red and oranges haven't come out yet. So I've, I've lightened my green here. And I want to think about mixing up a, a lighter green that would happen now, now when those gr greens are getting toastier. So I have a cadmium yellow medium here, and the cadmium yellow medium has a little bit of orange in it. It 
it's moving towards red. I might even add a little bit of red into it. And so I'm still getting my lighter green. But now I've moved it from my spring greens, those bright blue acidy greens, into something that is a little more neutral, a little more red, um, and working for this time of year. And this works also, you know, I think about this a lot. I, in my work now, um, I spend a lot of time um, painting uh, by the river and painting rocks. Um, and I don't use the strands so, um, so much anymore, but I still think in strands. So here I've got kind of a gray that I'm, a gray brown that I might use for a rock. Um, and let's say I want to lighten it. I'm gonna add a little bit of white. I'm gonna punch these a little bit lighter so that you can see the difference. And again, got a little bit chalky. And oftentimes the rocks where I am have a little bit of green in them. I'm actually going to use this green here. It's a little more neutral because they've got moss in them. So I'm going to take that medium value gray brown and lighten it up for where the light is hitting the rock and add a little bit of this green in it, change its color as I'm changing its value. And I can do the same when I'm thinking about that rock as it goes into shadow. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go for some blue violet here. I'm gonna add a little bit of alizarin crimson. I wanna make it more of a red violet, warm it up a little bit and bring that in. So again, I'm darkening it and changing its color at the same time. And so whether I'm working in oil paint or working um, in watercolor, uh, even when I was mixing ink for printmaking, this is how I was thinking about color. Um, every time that it shifted or modulated, thinking about how it changes both in color and in value and using these prismatic bright colors, even in the neutrals um, to create colors that have real vibrancy and life to them um, and don't go into the dullness that we find in the tint and shade method. So I'm gonna pass it on to Rebecca now. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Rebecca Lear, and uh, that was really fantastic. Thank you, Tanya, for asking uh, Ridgewood Art to be a part of this discussion. Um, Sarah, I was really looking forward to your demonstration because I, I, when we talked earlier, there was um, you had described a little bit difference in the strands, which we call strings, mm -hmm. and so you know that was that's really great to see. So a little bit of history um, of the Ridgewood Art Institute. Um, it was started in, in 1935, so not as, uh, as old as the Art Students League. And Arthur Maynard, who was a student of Dumond, um, began teaching at the Ridgewood Art Institute in 1948, and he taught there until his death in uh, 1991. Um, another student of Dumont's, Albin Albert, also came to the Ridgewood Art Institute and studied with Arthur Maynard and then began teaching um, uh, at the Institute himself. So Arthur had passed away by the time I came to the Ridgewood Art Institute. And um, yet we can see videos of his that's, that are on our website. and and. It's so interesting you described Dumond as talking in terms of music and Arthur Maynard uses those musical terms so much and, and middle C and um, here I thought it was Arthur, but it goes back to Dumond. So that's kind of cool. Um, and if you watch these videos, you'll see what I am I'm going to tell you. 
um, Arthur Maynard spoke through my teacher, John Osborne, and has a legacy of many painters that have passed on or are living elsewhere in the country now. And he said that our main purpose, our highest purpose as painters is to bring the painting to life. And that means we're in the study of light. So we're not studying a particular landscape or a nose or a face or a figure, we're studying light. And that is kind of, um, that's kind of heady stuff. I went to school at a time where, uh, art college, at a time when um, feeling was kind of dominant, you know, oh, it's a purple day, so I'm going to paint purple. And there was no discussion at least in these commercial, you know, schools of atmospheric perspective or nature's prism. So when I came to the Ridgewood Art Institute and studied with John Osborne and he opened the portal <laughs> of this palette, it was like seeing my world, um, you know, for the first time seeing it, you know, I'd been an illustrator for a couple of decades and to see the world with the colors that you were just describing, Sarah, how we change value and color was really kind of revelatory. So in teaching this to, you know, my own students, um, we talk about kind of getting our mind you know, mentally to a place where we can look at things not as a subject, but as the light that reveals it, you know, kind of, um, right, thinking in a new way. Um, the, uh, the palette that we use is, um, is not as expansive as what you showed, Sarah, um, the grays, um, the greens don't go far, you know, quite as, as, uh, as light and the, the blue string does not go into the greens. It looks like yours had uh, viridian or something in the greens to shift that sky, but learning the palette and understanding it like a language is kind of like a, a keyboard for a, a pianist. Ultimately you can compose the way you want. You can, you know, dance among the, uh, you know, the notes. And that's what I have found in learning this, this basic palette, which as you said, Sarah, is not a formula, um, but learn, understanding the value. So it's, you know, the grid and understanding the, the middle C value and the, the tones as they get into the shadow and the lights that correspond with uh, the gray value or the green value. Um, I can dance, you know, in my own composition of painting. Um, some of the teachers, I just want to mention some people that are this, this legacy um, is, uh, is so deep. I know that Arthur Maynard's uh, daughter is on tonight. And so that's very exciting. Um, Alison Betzel. Um, Joe Paquette, who is you know, many of you might know who's in the hills from the Midwest now is, uh, um, you know, carrying on the Dumont palette. Um, Laura Prey is here tonight. Um, so that's, we tube our paints at the Ridgewood Art Institute. Um, we mix them. There's a formula that uh, Dumont, I think, passed down to Maynard and Mason. And, uh, the formula that Maynard had we use and students tube their paints and paint with it. And um, so that's how we are carrying on the legacy. And um, that's all I have, a little shorter, shorter talk, but back to you, Sarah or Tanya. Thank you. Um, we had a couple, I had a couple of slides for you also, which we can try to see if they will work. 
um, that gave a sense of, you know, some of these things that you're talking about. Um, and it's amazing just thinking about how rich this legacy is. And um, there's been, here we are. Yeah. Um, hmm. Sorry. Um, there. So this is a, a beautiful mm -hmm. large scale uh, seascape that's in our exhibition by Arthur Maynard um, that, that shows how you know strong this teaching thread is. Um, and I think it's it's really important, you know, there's a lot of the history is, is represented by the Art Students League of New York. Um, but I think part of, of what's interesting about today's conversation is really celebrating the other other ways and directions, you know, that the teaching has taken. Um, in, in terms of geography uh, and, and other students of Dumond who taught at different institutions and in different settings. Um, and just sort of thinking about, you know, how, how that legacy has evolved in, in different directions. Um, so we're grateful to have this piece in the exhibition, to have Maynard and the Ridgewood story sort of as, as part of this. Um, just thinking about, about how you keep this teaching current and alive with your own students uh, is, is quite compelling. Yeah, you had mentioned um, here about, you I don't know if you wanna. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so this is actually, uh, uh, was made by Arthur Maynard. And you'll notice on the bottom, almost, it looks, you know, it's almost cut off on my, um, Hollywood Square screen. Um, there's some colors, they, they look kind of gray, but they are, uh, that's the start of a string that Arthur Maynard used for painting from the model in our North Lake studios. So uh, when you came by Tanya and came upstairs to see our studios, uh, you know, students are painting still life and um, I didn't have a model that day, but he uses the, you know, the, the same concept that Sarah was talking about, you change value, you change color. So when painting the model, starting on the lighter side with a gray orange, orange being closer to yellow, as that form shifts into the shadow, we go from the yellow to the red, ultimately to the violet. And um, so there's a, this, a string that we use for our portrait classes and figure classes that can be augmented to uh, you know, any skin tone. Um, but as you see here, it's not as, uh, there aren't as many values as what Sarah showed. And in the, the cobalt and white string, it is just cobalt and white, it doesn't, alter the color. So what we do in, in learning um, more fully our keyboard, so to speak, we can use the principles and shift on our own. So that is, is that. And the previous slide that you showed, Tanya, of the seascape, mm -hmm. um, Arthur, uh, that to me, it's, it's gotta be Monhegan um, from, you know, my own experience there. And um, Arthur took students to Monhegan and painted kind of in the tradition that you were describing um, Dumont did with his students in, in uh, Vermont. And, uh, and my teacher, John Osborne, um, used to take his students out on Sunday mornings locally. So that, you know, the foot in the camp of the plein air painting and then coming back to the studio and painting from the model to kind of clean up your, your drawing skills, right? That, that is carried on. Fantastic. Um, here, I also had another slide of, mm -hmm. of this sort of example piece that you showed me that your students use to compare when they're mixing up their paints. I think this is a great, a great yeah. piece. This is a big, a big board 
and it's at the studio for students to use and um, hopefully not dab color on, <laughs> but uh, to compare their, their mixing. Yeah. And then we have a work or two of yours. Yes, this is uh, beautiful. one of my seascapes from Monhegan and uh and another one yeah so hopefully in the tradition fantastic thank you um let's see i know we have a little bit of time um we could sort of chat amongst ourselves a little bit. I had a, a few, you know, questions or things I was thinking about, or we could see if there are questions from audience members or any other uh, painters in the audience who might want to compare or contrast their experiences. Um, now might be a good time for that. Um, but it's interesting, and, and Sarah, I know you had, when you studied with Francis Weston Hoyt, a lot of your experience was outdoors in plein air um, in New Hampshire. And I wondered if you could talk about, about what that was like, um, you know, whether it was, was it a sort of small group experience or were her classes fairly large? Um, just thinking, you know, about how it might have differed from, from Frank Mason's teaching or thinking about you know, that photograph we saw earlier of Dumond leading a session in Vermont. So Fran's teaching was um, less formal and I can only speak for you know, the last seven years of her life. I, um, but she gathered artists and painters wherever she was. And so she had this, um, so she had this kind of informal group of painters up in New Hampshire and um, I would go up for extended periods of time or I would spend my spring break on the side of the road, freezing cold in the snow. Um, and in those times, I was really kind of painting um, um, on my own. Um, and with Fran, Fran could talk about light and the palette no matter where she was. So many of my lessons actually happened in her kitchen while she was staring out the window and I was making lunch or I was driving her somewhere and she was pulling my visor down so that I could compare the darkness of the visor to the, you know, the value of the mountain. <laughs> um, so there just was never a moment in which painting and light was not discussed. Um, and there would be times where she would get, kind of gather people together um, for an afternoon of painting um, and then come back for her favorite, which was pineapple pizza, um, eaten with all the silverware, uh, silver out on the table. Um, so when I knew her, it was a little more informal, but she was forever gathering people of varying different levels of experience um, together. Wow, that sounds amazing. Um, so would she sort of mostly be working with students who were a little bit more advanced? I mean, sort of not working with beginning students necessarily, oh, but she with the, people who already were kind of engaged in practice. She had the, she had the full range, the full range. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow. It seems like that would be difficult um, logistically. Well, and I think, you know, it, it was when I knew her in, um, informal. So, you know, there would be times she would put and what, you know, I wasn't there for put groups together um, and go out for the afternoon. And you really could, you know, everyone would paint. And at that time, she was older. And therefore, um, she might, we would paint, and then she might come up for a little bit, or we would go back to her house for critique. And, um, you know, I think that was kind of one of the gifts and I saw this also with Mason which is um, there is always something to learn and to apply at every level and every experience level and that also was I think part of the gift of Dum the way that Dumont taught and the way that Mason taught um, was that you were in these mixed groups with people who were very new to much more experienced 
And so you were kind of always seeing what the next thing that you could learn was going to be from somebody who was more experienced, that kind of more intergenerational uh, teaching method. I've had the pleasure of working with a lot of the Lyman Allen's visitors in the exhibition and taking them through and, and speaking with, you know, people of all ages. Um, one of the things that we quite enjoy doing with, with everyone is identifying the time of day, the season, and what is the weather. Because I think what's so wonderful in, about landscape painting is you can always kind of find these identifying features, but particularly with en plein air painting is you know that the artist was truly experiencing a warm day or a cold day or, you know, the sunlight coming in in the morning and the, or the rains coming through. Um, so is there for, for either of you, Sarah or Rebecca, a particular weather, <laughs> um, you know, to say the least, that you find more compelling to paint and to approach with this color mixing? Or when you're in plein air painting, you really want a nicer day. You know, the wind will throw everything into <laughs> a bizarre <laughs> mix. I really enjoy painting in gray days. I, I just, uh, the softness of it. Um, I grew up in a part of New York State that is second to Seattle in cloudy days. <laughs> so maybe that's a little bit of home. But the, the, you know, coming to this understanding, this language of, of color um, older, you know, than, than you, Sarah, you know, coming to it later after having been through these paths of, uh, you know, being an artist and seeing things differently and realizing there's so much gray in nature and it's really beautiful. Um, so that's for me. I really love painting gray days. I, I'm prone to the gray as well. Yeah. I'm not big into the noon, big sunshine, but um, painting at different times of day um, and in different weather conditions was very important. Um, when I studied with Mason, we were on the hillside in a hailstorm for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and Fran also had that kind of hardcore, you know, um, kind of uh, painting mentality. Um, and, you know, because Fran was older, when I studied with her, we went and painted at a place that honestly had maybe two or three good views, but we painted there for an entire month. And it's interesting, you kind of get to this point where the thing that is, you have to find the interesting thing in the thing that's not particularly interesting. Um, which was a big kind of eye-opening thing for me as a young painter. Get some questions in the chat box that I want to make sure we share. Um, so someone wants to know, Sarah, what what was your actual palette that you had were were demonstrating on? Can you repeat that? Your your sound went out. Sorry. Uh, what what palette? What kind of palette do you use as like your base? Um, do you mean the colors? Um, the, the material itself. Is there like a material that it's easier to mix on um, or, you know, in order to not absorb the color that you're trying to work with and things like that? So um, I, I, I've wor I work on two kinds. One, one is glass. Mm -hmm. The one that I worked on today is a tempered piece of glass from a refrigerator shelf. <laughs> Really cheap, large sheets of glass. Let's go to your dump. Your dump. Um, the one that I do for plein air is is wood, but it's been patinaed. It's it's had so much paint over the years that it has a surface that cleans off really easily. But I, I particularly like the glass. I also have a glass one at home, um, but when I'm out painting plein air, um, I have a wood palette that is, you know, it's been oiled so much that it cleans off very nicely. Yeah. And then I'm gonna expand another another question, you know, placing the importance on 
practicing mixing color versus when you finally step out and go outside. Sarah, your demonstration was lovely, but that was years of frustration for me of, and why I wound up studying art history instead of art itself, <laughs> um, is that it's, it's quite challenging. So when in your studies did you take that leap from mixing and, and the practice to actually painting or was it kind of in hand? Well, I think, I think one of the real gifts and, you know, I wasn't able to get into it um, tonight was that what kind of also, what was kind of so amazing, you know, having Rebecca also go into a school where there was just like, figure it out, <laughs> you know, and you're kind of thrown in there and you don't know how things behave and you're mixing and God knows what you're getting, um, that part of also what went with this um, understanding of color mixing is really understanding kind of the quality of a color. And so a color might, a yellow might lean to, to green or it might lean to orange. Um, and what is, what is um, and how does that then affect what you're gonna get when you get out of blue? So part of, even if we just take the strands away, just learning how to work with the tubed colors that came with Fran and Mason's teaching was understanding the pigments and how they would behave so that you could problem solve in the field as you're working. And that, that was a huge gift just to like, let me know how this particular pigment behaves so that I have, I'm not just guessing. I find that um, the way that I learned at the Ridgewood Art Institute is um, um, before going outside where you have <laughs> the big wide world and, and you know not even a, a cropped, there's so much. Um, we would study from our teachers plein air sketches. And so we'd be inside, not dealing with gnats, you know, nah, you know, you're, you're inside where it's comfortable and you can more slowly mix the colors. And there was a teacher there that had painted that, knew the palette. It was a very um, uh, gentle way to learn. We have we have a pray a, we've approached the end of our, our time today, but I wanted to thank you all for coming and thank you, Tanya um, and Rebecca and Sarah. Um, just a quick plug for upcoming things with the Lyman Allen Art Museum. First, we are free all summer long. So through uh, Labor Day weekend, make sure you come and see the prismatic palette, see it again and see it again. <laughs> um, the prismatic palette, Frank Vincent Dumont and his students is on view until October 3rd. Um, coming up, though a little closer on August 22nd, the, one of our temporary exhibitions is leaving. So come also and see Memories and Inspiration, the Betty and the Carrie and Betty Davis collection of African American art. Um, and then our next program is this Sunday, August 15th from 2 to 3 p.m., um, where we're part of our Forest Dialogue Lecture Series um, with Anna Flores, contemporary painter and sculptor. Um, this program is planned in person at the museum, outdoors um, at the site of one of her installations on our sculpture trail in our sculpture gardens. However, just make note in case of rain that it will be a Zoom program. Um, but otherwise, we hope to see you soon at the Lyman Allen, and please really enjoy this truly sumptuous, colorful, vibrant exhibition. So thank you all.